those of you who I may not have had the pleasure of meeting, and some of them are on the line uh, today, um, is I am, my name is Brenda Verkley, and I'm the collaborative co-lead for the McMaster Collaborative for Health and Aging, alongside Dr. Rebecca Ganan, who is currently has the gift of a sabbatical. But we're really excited uh, to be hosting our first collaborative conversation of 2024. I want to welcome all of you, including our presenters who are going to introduce themselves in a few moments. But our topic of discussion today is sexually transmitted uh, and bloodborne infections and engaging elders uh, in, in, that, uh, in that area. I, uh, I, I was going to wear my special shirt. No, I don't have that shirt, but I wanted a shirt that says, I love social workers. And then I, I want to add, like, I love social work researchers. Um, so I've got a word to that because I'm an occupational therapist by background and I can only add jazz hands and I can only say how much I have valued and continue to value the perspective of social workers. I think there's lots of uh, overlap and the way we complement uh, each other, I'll say, amongst other professionals in terms of how we work towards uh, partnership and collaboration, uh, particularly on uh, important areas when it comes to people's health, uh, particularly the health of our older adults. I will say um, on the next slide, Allison, um, while we are gathering today on Zoom, we are fortunate to have people joining from across Canada, um, including Sheila, our elder, who will, again, Sheila, I'll come to you in a moment. But um, um, I just want to begin by acknowledging the land on which McMaster University is built and where I'm signed on from today, which, which is the tr traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations nations and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. I might do jazz hands again because uh, McMaster has established an indigenous uh, department uh, more formally as well as a new uh, master's uh, degree as well. And we're just, uh, yeah, we're move, we continue to move forward in partnership with our, uh, and I'll say our, with the indigenous, not our, the indigenous community. So, uh, so really important work that's being done uh, together with our scholars. Um, yeah, we acknowledge the importance of the land, which we each call home in part to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improve the relationships between nations and improve our understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Um, I, I want to take this moment and invite you to join me to remind ourselves of our commitment to equity and fairness in our work and beyond, and improving fairness includes acknowledging and addressing structural and systemic barriers and inequities, which continue to exist in part due to the colonial history in Canada. We do have some housekeeping reminders, uh, which is the webinar portion of this event is being recorded. So I, I'm I'm particularly pleased and grateful to our um, our speakers because that way we can continue to share this messaging for those who may not be able to gather live. But there's nothing like joining this uh, this talk live. So appreciate everyone for joining us here today. Um, just before one o'clock, we're going to stop the recording, and that's when our reflecting together time begins at one p.m. Um, and it's an opportunity to reflect uh, together, hence the reflecting together um, on on the conversation that occurred uh, today. So um, yeah, so stay stay for a little bit longer, please, uh, if you can, and uh, we'll be able to uh, have that conversation. And, and Sue and Allison will guide us through that. I do just want to go to the McMaster Collaborative for Health and Aging, which is hosting the webinar and um, uh, today, and. Um, and just say very briefly that we're a coalition of researchers, trainees, older adults and caregivers, including Tina and Mike. And I believe Tina's trying to join. She had uh, she had a commitment this morning, but she's going to try to be on the line. And Mike has already joined us um, and we work together uh, to improve the health and well-being of older Canadians together with our advisory committee, amongst others, um, to advance patient oriented research on aging. And again, you can see our three themes there in terms of uh, what we're focused on as a collaborative. And please uh, connect through social media to keep the conversation going. You can also see the collaborative past count, uh, collaborative conversations, including this one, which will be posted on our YouTube channel. We have trainee support. Yay. Uh, next slide, Allison. And uh, yeah, I, I say yay because uh, this important work is also being carried forward by the SPORE Network, who also have um, uh, have uh, established a scholarship very similar to this one. I think it's a compliment in many ways to try to carry uh, forward some of that messaging to the next generation of trainees. And, our, and we're very grateful to members of our advisory committee, amongst other members uh, and researchers of the collaborative who review 
uh, these grants, and it's an excellent opportunity to grow all of our skills um, in this area as researchers in terms of partnership and, and authentic partnership. Oh boy, here we come. I'm wrapping up slide, the last final slide with these beautiful pictures of our presenters. And Sheila, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much to everyone that's joined us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Sheila who will open us with uh, with a prayer. So thank you, Sheila. Why? So my name is uh, Sheila Nyman. I'm talking to you right now from British Columbia, the interior. I am on the territory of the Shaquemic people. I honor the Shaquemic people for keeping these lands in such a sustainable way that I can be here. I am from the Okanagan, so my nation is Silk, and I identify myself as a Silk Métis member of the Lower Similkameen Indian Band. I have a traditional name. I'm the first in four generations to carry that name. That name is Sauni Atkin. I was taken along with my five siblings in what is known across Canada as the 60s scoop. So that is the way that the residential school and the attempted genocide upon our first people. That's how it plays in my life. I have uh, children, adults, I have grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So I get to witness these ways and the past. I get to witness them become less and less. Although we are still strive to, to get our feet grounded and connected into who we are. And I'm honored to be here still to do that. I'm going to invite each of you, whether you're in person or whether you're sitting in your room, doesn't matter. I'm going to invite you to center yourself in, bring yourself in to your into your inner self. If it's comfortable for you, close um, your eyes. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk, but I'm in this. Does uh, Dana and Sam right there? Yeah. A little bit of some, yeah, yeah that's okay. kind of new. Okay, no, we're just pulling people together and just giving people an update. Okay, <laughs> so we'll just keep going. Bring yourself in. I'm gonna actually take you on a journey. I'm gonna invite you to journey with me as we invite the ancestors of the territories that we are on and the ancestors that we walk with to connect as we connect with each other. And this is really very much connected with elders and why we would want elders, elders counsel, elders support in everything that we're doing. As elders, we can provide a link to wisdom to knowledge, as we age, that link gets stronger. And we can help you and support you. That's one of the main gifts I believe that as elders we have. So I'm gonna invite you to breathe in through your nose, right into your diaphragm, your belly should push out and breathe out with your mouth. Again. Breathe in deeply through your nose, thanking the maker of breath for that medicine, that oxygen. Right into your diaphragm and breathing out anything you don't need for this time that we're going to be together. Out to the universe to be cared for there. As you continue to listen to my voice and breathe in that way, this time breathe in to your diaphragm, right through your hips, your thighs, your knees, your calves, your feet, and right through the floor, right to the earth and to the energy left by the ancestors of the territory that you are on. As we say, Lim Lim, thank you, Miigwech, to those ancestors for holding the lands in such a sustainable way that you can be where you are and I can be where I am. And on our next breath, consciously, just with the thought, with your mind, 
connect with those ancestors that entered this life plane when you did. They're in our blood. They're in our DNA. They're in our cells. Ancestral wisdom is there. It flows within us. We merely need to become aware of it. And right now we connect with the ancestors that walk with us, that are in our blood, and we connect them to the ancestral energy of the ancestors of the lands that we are on. Fully connected. Think of your mind connecting with your heart, your heart with your mind. As we each connect our hearts with each other, even though we're not in the same room, with a thought we can do that. All one mind and one heart. As we move in and feel that connection, one heart, one mind, with our hearts connected together and our thoughts focused on this conversation. Grandmothers and grandfathers and spirits of the four directions, Lem Lem, Quolin Chutin, thank you for the honor of being in this circle for each of the hearts that beat here and the thought and the care that they bring forward, the compassion for health and well-being of our human family. Watch over our brothers and sisters who are lost in violence and addictions. Help them to remember who they are as we send love out and invite them back into the circle. as each one of us collects that place of love and we send it out around the globe. And we especially take that love like a flashlight and shine it onto those that are causing harms, wars and killing. Help them to feel that place of love that each of them have because they are human too. Help them to feel that love so that they can recognize that they have the power to stop doing what they're doing. They have the power to contribute to creating a world where we all have what we need as a human family. Help us to move forward into the future in a good way, maintaining our humanity until we get there, each one of us. Watch over us now as we focus, watch over our families and we say, thank you, Lim Lim all my relations. Thank you. I guess it's my go, right? Okay. Do you got the slides up, Bridget? Or? Yeah, I'll share the slides now, Randy, if you'd like okay. to introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Randy Jackson. I identify as Anishinaabe from Kettle and Stony Point First Nation. My training is both in, in sociology and also in social work. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's sort of, yeah. So anyways, I'm currently an assistant, prof or no, as an associate professor, sorry, that's relatively new <laughs> for me to have to say <laughs> that. But yeah, I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work, and I have a cross appointment in health and aging as well. And I've known about the collaborative uh, center here for quite some time. And that's nice to be connected and, and able to contribute in this little way. Um, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll just take it from there. Next slide, please, Bridget. I'm, I am the co-lead of, of the Fee Center for Indigenous SDBBI Research, along with my community partner, which is uh, um, community alliances and networks, uh, or CAN, um, and and we came together to design uh, a a it's, it's largely a training center grant that looks at how you use community based research combined with with indigenous and decolonizing methodologies um, to support a more holistic way of of researching and understanding STBBIs as it affects indigenous communities. Um, so again. Um, the center grant works across all the four pillars of health, including clinical, basic science, epidemiology, and social science. 
and we offer a number of different activities uh, for people to become involved, including community fellowship awards. So these are targeting community groups across Canada that are interested in, in learning how to work with uh, with in research and, and with alongside scholars. Um, we have graduate scholarships, both at the MA and PhD level, and we offer writing retreats as well as land-based learning series. Um, and um, we, if you check out the website on McMaster for the Fee Center, you'll notice that there are also um, Indigenous Sexual Futures podcast and as well as a conversation series. So next slide, please, Bridget. I, 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 this is largely a, um, um, going to be a, an acknowledgement of the research that Bridget's going to present just a bit early or a bit later than me. And, um, yeah. And so just acknowledging some of the co-authors that have been on in contributing to the, to the findings that Bridget did. Um, uh, next slide. And so this is our current, um, Council of Elders, and they've been, this is probably um, the most, uh, one of the best things I think that we've done at the Fee Center is bring elders together in much the way that Sheila described. They're here to help us. Next slide, she, uh, Bridget. This Council of Elders is it represents uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, as well as gender diversity. So we have male, female, um, um, trans, uh, non-binary, two-spirit, all uh, embodied and, and lived through uh, the people that I introduced to you just a bit earlier with uh, on the pictures. And so this this um, this Council of Elders is looking to support the Fee Center and the way and teaching us how as scholars how to use indigenous knowledge in STBBI research. They provide guidance for the Feast Center and our decisions and activities. So they're woven throughout almost everything that we do. Um, they help to mentor academic and community researchers. And these are academic and community research from both uh, indigenous communities as well as allied communities. Um, and the important thing is that you're doing research uh, that's Indigenous focus in the area of STBBIs. And so their leadership teachings, cultural gifts, um, encourage this transformative change um, and addressing uh, health needs of Indigenous peoples living with or affected by STBBIs. And I'm going to turn it back over to Bridget, and she's going to walk you through the findings of this study, which which uh, came at the suggestion of, uh, Bridget was an MSW student of mine and she wanted to, to contribute to the Fee Center. And this is where we sort of landed as, as a potential need for her. And she just ran with it. And I'm happy to give her the floor so she can tell you a bit more about it. Bridget. Thank you so much, Randy. Uh, Randy's an awesome supervisor, by the way. Just need to put that <laughs> plug in there. Um, and I just wanted to know if Sheila would like to offer a few words now about her experience on the Feast Center Council of Elders before we move forward. You're on mute, Sheila. Yeah, yeah, I caught that pretty <laughs> fast, actually, for me. <laughs> you did? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to. I, I was one of the, I think I was the first elder uh, council member. And then uh, I was a part of forming the council, which ended, ended up being eight. We have two new ones, people coming on. And the vision wasn't 100% clear. We, it was left organically to see how the elders would blend and weave and, and how that would work. And I think now there's a fantastic model happening here of how to include, how to utilize and channel and the wisdom of lived experience of elders who have different walks of life. We, each one of us, some of us have carry more ceremony. Some of us, um, or maybe have some academic experience. I myself, I have a master's in social work that I did as an older person when I when I went to university and did that. And uh, 
some of our elders are involved in research. However, we are all elders and we each have our own gift. When we as a group come together and the feast, we're visioning the feast and we're making plans for the feast center, we all get to put our perspective and our ideas forward. Those ideas are woven and the, as the feast is, is uh, I mean, it's been several years now as we're moving on into um, this whole project, you can see the, the beauty of what each of the elders brings. We, uh, I myself really benefit spiritually, intellectually, by having other elders to counsel with. In the time of the old ones, the elders were revered, they were looked after, they were nurtured for that wisdom that they carry based on all of their experience in their life. And so we get to bring that together. Um, I don't know, I could probably say so much but I think that's about the essence is that we can bring, we can be brought as elders council, we can be brought situations and we can sit and talk about them. Our elders in times of old, when there was a problem or when there was a situation that the, the family, the community needed to deal with, all of the elders got together we would be sitting in whatever structure was our that we use because there's many across this land and we would talk about it and each person's voice was important each person's perspective was added to the next person and the next person until a brilliant way was uh, developed so I don't know what more, without seeing us in action, hanging out with us, I don't know what more I can say about that, all my relations. Thank you, Sheila. I've had the opportunity to hang out with the Council of Elders, and let me tell you, it's hard for me to keep up with them. <laughs> <laughs> they are quite a bunch of amazing people, and I've learned so much from the elders as well. And Sheila has also been a close mentor of mine for several years. So I came back to school as a mature student. Um, I am of Irish descent. I'm a settler and an ally in progress, I hope, in process. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get connected to Randy through the School of Social Work. And I actually read his research. He was one of my favorite researchers. He's gonna kill me for saying this. Uh, when I worked in the community um, and then I, I was at McMaster and I'm like, Randy's teaching this course. Of course I have to take it. And I connected with Randy and I told him about my um, inspiration to serve and work alongside indigenous communities. And he invited me in, graciously invited me into the fee center. Um, so I just, I loved it and I worked there for the better of four years and now I'm blessed as an awardee, which gives me the opportunity to maintain that, that mentorship. So I was motivated by my past work in HIV and sexual health and sexual violence, um, and harm reduction. And I worked with a lot of indigenous teachers in the field and I saw the transformation that folks underwent when they reconnected with their culture, when they reconnected with their elders and how much it changed their health, their mental health, their physical health, their spiritual health. And I was able to witness that. So I carried those memories with me into uh, research at McMaster and social work. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to be a helper to the Fee Center Council of Elders. So I got to see the council in action and to see what they brought to research, the substance, the wisdom, the knowledge, the guidance, the leadership. So, 
so often in past research, you'd hear about elders and they'd be called in at the last minute. Oh, can you come in, elder so-and-so, and, and do a prayer? Can you come in and close the ceremony? But elders are researchers. They've always been researchers for thousands and thousands of years. So they need to be meaningful partners in this research. So we did our best in this study to ground it in Indigenous and decolonizing methodologies. So as a settler, I cannot claim Indigenous methodologies. I work towards decolonizing methodologies to um, reestablish and um, reform colonial structures and governance back to in the hands of Indigenous folks. But the Indigenous methodologies, methodologies were led by the elders who were co-authors of the study of the Fee Center Council of Elders, who guided this study, who helped create the, the study question, who helped guide the methodology and the method. And this study is centered on the elders' knowledges, relationship building, ethical engagement, and genuine representation. There were 13 elders who participated in this study, and they were from across, nation, across nations. It was done during the end of the pandemic, so we wanted to do a vir virtual talking circles. Um, and elders being involved meaningfully in a study emphasized the use of these methodologies and strengthen meaningful research partnerships. Now, Sheila, would you like to talk to us a little bit more about the talking circle as an indigenous research method? Absolutely. So uh, um, there's talking circles. I, I see there's two different ones. One is a talking circle. We sit in a circle and we talk about a particular subject. And then there's sharing circles. For me, sharing circle is more leaning towards healing. So in a talking circle, there's gonna be a topic. There's gonna be a certain amount of minutes that the person can spend. In a sharing circle, where we're doing healing and reaching deep inside of ourselves and talking, there's no topic. It's what that person needs to speak to. And there is no time. You would not tell them, okay, your, your time is up. It's, it's healing. So those are, I, I differentiate those two. And a circle, you know, when you think of a circle, we're all sitting side by side shoulder to shoulder nobody's above and nobody's below everybody is equal everybody is equal in that circle you think again about a circle if you're holding a talking pet piece um that is a commitment that every word that you speak is the truth and is important and it's kind and it's loving um the idea of the energy moving and it would depend on where you are if you're on vancouver island you would go counterclockwise because that is the way they see energy move if you're more on a landline or in it would be clockwise so when i'm doing a circle the eagle feather is passed to the left each person gets to speak and say what they have to say. And each person gets to express what they need to express. Um, yeah, so each person gets a chance to speak. Each person is important when they're speaking. They're the most important person in the room because they're the one speaking. That's who we listen to. Nobody interrupts. You don't uh, stop a person when they're when they're talking. You you just listen. So very similar, like to I guess focus groups, but focus groups are very uh, uh, 
they're defined. There's how much time there's, this is what you talk about. Um, and in a talking circle, we, we bring in spirit. We're sitting in a circle. Each heart is connected. Our hearts are connected just as ours are here in this virtual room that we're all in. Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions, actually, all my relations. That was perfect. Thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. So just talking a little bit more about the, the components of the study, we held three virtual two-hour talking circles with 13 elders. And the beautiful energy that the elders brought to these circles over the laptop was just incredible. One of the elders, while he was speaking, actually caught an eagle feather and pulled it down into the screen to share in the talking circle. I'm like, this couldn't have been planned any better. This is what elders bring um, to the talking circle. So um, the elders were forthcoming and sharing even more so than was requested. The elders each, as Sheila was saying, took their turn, took their time, and then signified to the group when they were ready. Elders brought medicines to the talking circle. They were opened and closed by elders with traditional prayers, blessings, and songs. And then we worked together to take the findings of these talking circles to develop a qualitative thematic analysis of the transcripts. So I worked with the transcripts through hand coding them. And then I brought them back in member checking sessions or feedback sessions, however um, you might call it, brought it back to the elders who were interested in, in working on the writing piece and brought back these themes and all the findings. There was pages and pages of findings. We went through it. The elders helped reshape the findings of the study, helped say, you know what? That resonates, that actually doesn't resonate. I think you need to change that a little bit. So we worked together to really shape all of the findings of the research. Now I would like Sheila to please review with us the five key themes that emerged from all of the findings from the talking circle. So these five key themes are meant as guidance and advice for researchers and how to meaningfully partner with elders in research and to strengthen those ongoing partnerships in research in sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. Go ahead, please, Sheila. Absolutely. I would say with that right off the top and right out front is relationship. Uh, re relationships are absolutely critical to working with, with elders, uh, very critical. And um, so I'm just going to read if, this if it's okay. So the five key findings, one is understanding the historical and ongoing impacts of colonialism and the need to decolonize STBBI research. So that's uh, understanding who we are, where we came from, and the impacts of contact and the genocide, the attempted genocide in each of our lives. Uh, we show up with, with that history, even though you can't see it and we may not even have told you about it, we show up with it, it impacts it, who we are and how we walk in the world. Um, prioritizing the knowledge and lived experience of elders and indigenous people living with STBBI throughout the research process. So critical, again, uh, we can study and read and look at all kinds of scientific journals about things, but until you've actually sat with somebody and heard them and felt them who are living it, you don't know exactly what, what that whole impact has or how it weaves it right into their DNA, right into their cells and how they present. Very critical to understand. 
our history. So centering spirituality and ceremony in indigenous STBVI research, also super critical because we are spiritual. Everything about us is spiritual. And uh, anywhere you meet elders, uh, well, not all elders, I shouldn't say that, that might get confusing because some of, some of us aren't there yet. You know, some of us have been impacted by uh, residential school and what residential school did about our own culture and our ways and our ceremonies. So some of us are still, um, we're still walking through that and finding who we are without all that. And that's a process. Um, the importance of implementing Indigenous methodologies in STBBI research. Um, I think that goes without saying, eh? And foregrounding Indigenous ways of being, knowing, and doing in STBBI research. So those are the key findings, key themes, or the findings and the five key themes. Um, keeping all this in the front of your mind as you're working with indigenous people. And even if they are young people and they have grown up with their families, every single one of us has been touched by the legacy of residential school and contact. Every single one of us. And different, depending on where we've come from. Like I didn't go to residential school, but my grandparents did. I experienced the 60s scoop. It still impacts me today, The how that has uh, shows up in my life. So when I think involving elders, make sure you're involving them and that they're not just, oh, we have elder Sheila and, and my name goes up somewhere. Uh, Make sure you've met with me. You've had a sat and had tea with me. I know Bridget has uh, been with every single one of us, even having fun, shopping, eating, sharing lots of things that we just all do. And I think that's important just to, the elders need to know who we are too. So we need to show them who we are. All my relations. Beautiful. Thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So as Sheila so eloquently shared with you, one of the major themes that came out of the study was Indigenous ways of being, knowing, and doing in SCBBI research is fundamental to engaging elders as meaningful partners. So that means maybe slowing things down, maybe having some cedar tea, maybe sharing in um, the burning of sage, some cedar brushing. As you can tell, I've learned a lot and I've got to experience a lot of these beautiful things. These are part of the research. These are the most meaningful parts of the research. Mm -hmm. So just taking your time and sometimes those academic deadlines, they just need to wait and it is well worth it. So even I, with the master's, um, my master's social work, thesis, I actually had to take a little extra time because the feedback sessions, the member checking sessions with the elders was more important than meeting that deadline. And the School of Social Work was wonderful and Randy and everybody was very supportive that I needed that extra little bit of time to do it right, to do it in a, in a as Sheila would say, in a good way, or I'm learning to do things in a good way. So now I would like Sheila to please share with you Elder Aggie's advice to researchers. Um, Elder Aggie was um, an, a wonderful, is, sorry, still a wonderful elder who really um, was enthusiastic and participated in this study like full force and really brought so much richness and teachings to this study. So. Um, I wish I could share all the findings with you, but that would take all day. So um, I would like Sheila to share um, Aggie's words on with you. Please go ahead, Sheila. 
Okay, so Aggie says, the best advice I can give is to listen to what they have to say because they know. They know the experiences. They know what they have seen. It's not anything you can find in a book in the mind of an elder. A long time ago, we didn't have written knowledge. It was an oral tradition, and that's how knowledge was passed down from generation to generation. Listen and act on the knowledge that you're being taught. You are going. We know what we're talking about because we lived it. We are the ones that are teaching you. Can't we can't live up, give up on our, our youth? I'm going to say that again. We can't give up on our youth. We have to keep trying to teach them, because if they don't learn the ways, then it's going to die with our generation, and we can't let that happen. Be open to everything and listen to them, because we haven't always been listened to in our lives and they're just as important as an elder they're our future thank you sheila so those words from elder aggie really resonate with many parts of the study and how the elders said it's essential especially for elders to reconnect and rebuild intergenerational relationships with the youth and we know like that is happening in in communities all over um and across nations already but to strengthen those relationships because like pre-contact the elders were so close to the youth in teaching rites of passage in ceremony and talking about sexuality and teaching about relationships and a lot of that was disrupted through colonialism. So coming mm -hmm. back and building those intergenerational relationships are paramount. So Aggie was really stressing that um, in her message. Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to talking about sexuality and STBBI prevention. So there are many implications, but to narrow it down, some of the implications of this research really indicate how research partnerships with elders will enrich, improve research for Indigenous communities. Um, having the elders as partners can draw in other folks from the community to actually be interested in participating in the research because they're like, oh, my elder, my mentor, my teacher, they're helping to lead this research. So I trust it. I'm happy to be involved now. Um, it'll draw more youth into the research, more parents and families. Um, it ensures that it's culturally grounded and ethically sound, and it comes from a strengths-based approach. The elders will make sure to draw back the researchers and say, hey, you know what? You're going in the wrong direction. This is how you need to do things. This is how you need to reshape your approach. And elders are leaders and they don't have a problem speaking up and telling researchers how they need to make those changes. Right, Sheila? Right, Randy? <laughs> um, and this research informs policies to support Indigenous peoples affected by STBBI through sustainable funding that encourages, that includes and prioritizes traditional healing practices and culturally distinct STBBI programs for Indigenous communities. So not taking a pan-Indigenous approach, but investing in each unique community and responding to the needs of that community and not making assumptions. You know, what might be needed at, at Six Nations of the Grand River isn't necessarily needed up north by um, Inui communities. You know, mm -hmm. we can't make assumptions and the communities need to speak for themselves and who better to be involved and speak for the communities than the elders. Um, Sheila, could you please share this um, great quote with us? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, indigenous knowledges are sacred, localized and require deep respect when requested, applied and shared. 
This study offers future Indigenous STBBI researchers a robust foundation to build meaningful research partners with elders to improve STBBI research and benefit the sexual health and well being of Indigenous communities. All my relations. Beautiful, thank you. So this is the, the title of the study. Um, so this is an MSW thesis. Uh, a publication is in the works um, with some of the elders have agreed to be involved in writing the publication um, or at least checking me on it. So that's in process as well. Um, we'd love to get that published hopefully in the very near future. It's very close. Um, we're also working on like community um, knowledge tools that are more accessible and can just be shared with community members so they don't have to read a hundred and something page thesis, which is way too onerous. So um, we're working on some of those more accessible things to, to bring to the people. So the study can move forward and not only stay within Max sphere. Awesome. So I have no idea what time it is. How are we for time? You're great for time. We are, we have about uh, just over 10 minutes for questions. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. I'm going to just is, um, stop sharing. Is that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. And the one thing I forgot to mention, Bridget, was uh, I know you wanted me to, the artwork that you see in the slides are all from my private collection. And I know each one of the artists personally, and they're all originals. Um, so I just wanted to, and there are several, I think three or four different artists involved. So I just wanted to say that all my relations. Thank you, Sheila. Randy, I'm not sure if you had any, sorry, I'm put, totally putting you on the spot. If you had any words that you wanted to share before we move to questions. Yeah, I was just, I was reflecting on, on as you were talking, you both were talking about Sheila's opening comments and her perspective on, on, um, the ways in which Indigenous people are intimately connected, they experience that connection across, you know, and our 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 uh, our connection to the land, other people in our communities, you know, whole everything you can think of are connected. There's that connection, and I was inspired by that because it's like, wow! Imagine if you, because if you think of Indigenous methodologies as being an approach to doing research. Imagine if you'd started off with that perspective and allowed it to shape what you were doing in the way in which Sheila described it as being um, grounded in community, as as weaving that Indigenous knowledge through the work that you do, um, using that knowledge to not only gather information, but maybe to try to understand that. Um, and these are all the 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 goals of the fee standard for Indigenous SBI research, is learning mm -hmm. about learning this from our elders in ways that we can, as scholars, take it up in our research and have it shape the way in which we do research. So that's about it, Bridget. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Just could if I could add to that, Randy. Yeah, uh, for sure. That. The, I know in my nation, and my nation's not the only nation that believes this, uh, but the land, the land is inside of us. When I go to my territory, the land remembers me. The land knows me, and I feel it, mm -hmm. just like a relative who I haven't seen in a long time. It The land embraces me, and I embrace it as it fills me. So when you have elder involvement, you have that full connection. And when it comes to our own territories, where for the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years that we have been on those territories, and you think of that energy 
every step, every plant we pick, we thank it. We have a reciprocal energy transference going with that plant as we thank it as the from the animal that we harvest to feed us. Everything, the water that we drink, exchanging this energy reciprocally. That's a lot of energy. Energy never dies. It merely transforms. Mm -hmm. So it's all still there. So when you have elders present, you are completely linked. They are the link. They are the link to the past in the full energy form, not just words or thought, but full unseen, unheard from the other senses that we all have as human beings here. All my relations. Thank you, Sheila and Randy. Mm -hmm. No questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, may I? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hi, Lance. Yes. Yes. I'm, for one thing, I really want to apologize. I'm so late. I was in physio till uh, about 11, 11.30, quarter 12, and then I come home by dark, and I got here, and I was so confused. I was but uh, am I not correct by understanding that this is a piece that uh, we wanting to understand more about the transmitting of, of bone culture and stuff like that? Um, and why I ask and why I say that is because I thought this would be a good speech for me to listen to and participate in because I had an amputation and my amputation was because I lost 10 centimeters of bone in my femur. Now that bone grew back nine point something centimeters, but it wouldn't stabilize in the leg to stay healthy and, and stay uh, completed. But I did lose my leg from uh, my hip from 12 inches from my hip. But it, the success, the big success was that that bone stabilized enough to grow uh, 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 nine point something centimeters in my leg back and that was quite a doing i was the first one in southern ontario to wear the lizrod fixator and there's been many devices to come out after that successfully mine was successful to the extent where we had to take it because it was just too weak but Thanks so much for sharing, um, Lance. Um, this session will be recorded, so you can catch the the beginning of the session uh, that you missed, and we'll we'll circulate the link to that afterwards. Uh, but I, I see we have a, a couple hands up here. I guess I'm off. Then am I? And I just wanted to quickly say hi to Lance, because I know Lance is a community activist, and I'm sorry you're struggling with your health, Lance. I hope things get better, and I know physiotherapy is so important for pain and for your body, and I just wanted to thank you for the work you do in the Hamilton community um, and for being here today. It really has been easy, but I'm I'm pushing forward, trying to go forward. Um, people say they're going to help, but I'm pushing forward. Yeah, it's very tough. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing with us, Lance. Thank you. Tim. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to see you folks, and specifically Randy, nice to see you as well. Um, my mm -hmm. question for the presenters is regarding um, in when, when we speak of Indigenous methodologies, it's always important to kind of center it or be as specific as possible. So if you're doing research on um, like, like, uh, like in the West Coast, and you want to focus on on Squamish specific ways of knowing that you would focus on that. But what are your thoughts on urban, um, like integrating Indigenous methodologies in urban settings? How do we center or make it as specific as possible when there can be 
First Nations perspectives, Inuit perspectives, uh, how do we kind of integrate that to make it as impactful? Bridget, do you want to give it a shot or? I will. I'll just start really quickly as um, I am still a learner. As one of uh, the mm -hmm. elders on the council says, settlers are infants when it comes to Indigenous knowledge. So I'm still an infant. But I can say that in my past community work in the urban centers and in this study, which had 13 elders from across nations, as Sheila was saying, they, they came together and they brought, they decided as a group how they wanted to approach the research, how to share, so they shared their own nation's cultural protocols in the research. And we were able, they were able to really, I just, I felt like a, a learner and a facilitator more than anything. They were able to bring and integrate the different cultural protocols from their different nations, Tim, into the study. And as far as, and I, what I do know of urban centers is that oftentimes that happens as well. And oftentimes they will connect very closely, say Hamilton with Six Nations of the Grand River. I'm just, I'm speaking about like of what I know and they would draw in a lot of their cultural protocols and learning, but are always willing to open it up to other nations, like people with, like you said, who might be in different urban centers, but have a different mm -hmm. um, ancestry. And Sheila, Randy, I don't know if you have anything you would like to add. Thank you, Tim. Yes, thanks, Bridget. So um, yeah, I, I do, Tim. And that is that a very powerful teaching that, that we all have in, in various ways, but it's the core of it is the same, is that you follow the way of the territory you are on. That is critical. When we go to another territory, like even me, I'm, I'm self, I'm from the territory below where I'm at right now, which is Shaquamic territory. So first, I follow the way of this land here, of these traditions, and then I bring mine in. And so even our urban people, and I've been urban as well. So I learned the way um, of, the, of the territory that I'm on. Like I said, if you're like for the direction of passing an eagle feather or smudge, for that direction, if you're on the island, you go counterclockwise because it's the island and that's the way mm -hmm. that they go. And if you're on the mainland, it's clockwise. And then there's a few other uh, territories that have have their own little ways as well, right? But it's, you know, right or left. So mm -hmm. that's just one simple one right there. So following the way of the land that you're on, and then the individual way of, of where you're from, all my relations. And maybe I'll just add my voice there as well. And that it's, um, we early on in Feast, we wrote a paper called Amama Wazing. And Amama Wazing is a, a Anishinaabe word, which tells us to collaborate or work together or come to understanding together through difference. In other words, what we do is we attempt to represent all that diversity in our approaches to doing research, but also how we understand things. So like Sheila said, when we, we center ourselves on the, terri we're, on the territory we're on and we do ceremony connected to that research in a particular way that differs across the country, right? Because they're not, we're talking about incredibly diverse um, uh, indigenous groups across Canada, and it's not all the same. And you can't. There's no, no. There's no cookie, cookie. Oh, sorry. No cookie cutter that that you can draw upon and use. So that's why we came up with this, or or that's why our we were told about about we we need to be careful when we're we're doing research in terms of synthesis in terms of understanding that that we're also attending to that idea of diversity around that idea right so we're we're not trying to erase that difference or that diversity in understanding we're trying to represent it there 
give it a voice, elevate it, amplify it. And that's what we try to do. Does that help, Tim? Yeah, that helped a lot. Thank you so much. You're welcome.